Okay, um, so welcome everyone to uh, our track session. This is um, joint between Seaway and Causebay. Uh, it's the um, underrepresented groups in agricultural on applied economics findings from the Seaway Causebay survey. Um, so we'll start off with um, our survey lead, Anna Josephson, um, who's going to show us some uh, results uh, from the survey, and then we'll turn to our panelists and go around, um, do a roundtable with some questions, as well as questions from the audience. Yeah, great. Can everybody see my screen? Has that worked out and hear my voice? All right. So, um, I'll just take like 10 minutes right now and talk through the results that we have so far and that we're still processing from um, the two surveys that we undertook in the past year or so. So this is joint work from both Causebay and Seaway. You can see we've got a whole bunch of people who have contributed um, to these efforts um, within the past sort of two years that we've been working on this. Um, the Motivation for this work is to, to quantify the status of women and, and minorities and to inventory strategies that have been undertaken successfully um, or unsuccessfully by different academic units and departments um, within the profession broadly. And so we did this with two surveys. The first was a department head survey. This only went out to academic departments, but this is distributed in May of 2019 we received 43 responses to that survey from unit heads um, across the U.S. and Canada. Uh, we also distributed an individual survey that was sent out in January of 2020. Um, we closed it in May, I believe, of 2020, and we got just over 650 responses to that. So that's really, really lovely. Um, and I'll present some results from both of these surveys today, mostly focusing on the department head survey since we're still processing most of the results from the individual survey. So within these surveys, um, we were asking for, from the department head, that is the department head responding. So we were asking for information about their faculty, um, their staff and research associates, graduate students, undergraduate students, and then a set of questions about diversity and inclusion within their unit, strategies that they've undertaken um, to promote and ensure diversity and inclusion within their unit, and those sorts of things. Um, the uh, individual survey asked for demographic and biographical information about people, and then perceptions and experiences within their unit and perceptions and experiences within the AAEA specifically. So I'm just gonna just dive into results because I don't wanna talk for very, very long. I wanna move on to our panelists and get some discussion going. But um, what I'll present first here in, in these um, pie charts, show on the left hand side here the tenure track or tenured faculty and the non tenure track faculty on the right um, and broke having broken down the um, report, reporting from department heads of the um, whether someone is white female white male an underrepresented minority female or an underrepresented minority male um, and i think that <laughs> what is probably most striking is that in pretty much every group, um, both within the tenure track and not within the tenure track, a uh, plurality or majority of people are white men um, across the profession in these positions. Um, yeah, there, there, is, there are a few that sort of stand out to me in places where there's a little more parity. For example, in the assistant professors of extension, um, but the parity in this case comes between white men and white women, where people um, of either gender and underrepresented minorities are a, still a small portion. Um, the full professors of extension is also quite, quite striking, uh, just being almost 75% men. If you do look at the non-tenure track faculty and the associate extension, full extension, full teaching, you actually see no representation. Oops, sorry, I moved slides. You see no representation from um, non-white people. So, um, 
I think that this is a good first step for us. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do is establish um, an on this work to be ongoing so that we can see how things changes, change through time. CSWEP has done this for quite some time, um, and so we're hoping to establish a similar panel. Um, we do have some previous work that we can compare this year in 2019 against. Um, that came from Zepeda and Marchant in 1998. They did a survey in 1996. And so what we have here is on the this side, on the left-hand side here, we have um, the 1996 survey. And then on the right-hand side, we have the 2019 survey. This is just broken down into white women, white men, and then underrepresented minority people are grouped into one category regardless of their gender. And what you can see from looking at these is we are seeing increases of white women and underrepresented minority people of both genders between those two samples. So that's, that's a, good, a good start between 1996 and now. Um, but we do see, when you look at these numbers a little more closely, that there's a decreasing proportion of each group that's moving from assistant to associate that isn't explained by the fact that there aren't people in those lower groups. So it's not just a stock effect um, that's happening there. So again, we are just, in this case, talking about academic units. It would be really good, especially at as um, our profession is so much broader than academic units to include the, those outside entities where ag and applied economists are. So that's something we're considering how to do effectively as we move forward. Um, we also do ask, we did ask in this case about um, PhD programs, master's programs, and undergrad programs. Um, most of the department heads who responded were good about giving me a kind of an asterisk and saying, these undergrad numbers are a bit of a guesstimate for me. <laughs> They're hard to get. So um, I'm just presenting in this case the PhD programs and the master's programs. Um, of the 43 respondents that we had, 25 have PhD programs and 33 have master's programs. <laughs> Within the PhD programs there are a lot of white men. Um, you can see that reflected um, within the, the graphs here at the bottom, although you do see a bit more balance in the most recent graduates that are reported. But when you look and, and turn to the academic job market, you can see that um, the offers extended and the on-campus interviews reflect um, the placement of mostly white men into those, those positions. Um, we also here have just some breakdowns on whether a special accommodation was requested and whether that position was accommodated. Um, so there, there are a number of, actually, of the 12 that were requested, nine were accommodated, which I, as a spousal a person in a spousal accommodation situation, found very encouraging. Um, 33 units have master's programs. Um, I don't present numbers on this just to keep it a little shorter, but it's interesting to see that in the master's programs, there are parity between white men and white women, um, and parity between underrepresented minority men and underrepresented minority women, although those numbers are far, far, far smaller. Um, there are actually more white women in master's programs than in the other, um, in any other representation. So, Anna, there was one of a... the other things we did at the end of the survey was ask the unit heads to select strategies for diversity and inclusion that they do within their unit. Yes. Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, there's a question. How do we yes. define underrepresented minority? In this case, non-white. Um, I can, after I stop talking, I'll pull the formal definition that we used in the survey. Um, so you can see that. I should have started with that. That's a great idea. Um, so we asked about strategies for diversity and inclusion. This was um, having the unit heads check a list. We asked about 12 strategies. Um, I'm just reporting six of them here. I report the three that were most responded to, so somewhere between 69, between 70 and 72 percent effectively of departments said that they did these three strategies. Um, but even on the lower end, it's 40%, 42% of departments were reporting doing these strategies. So people were really saying that 
there are a lot of um, strategies that they're undertaking within their units. Um, one thing that we looked at when we were analyzing this was to see if there's a correlation between reporting doing particular sets of strategies or doing more strategies and um, having more diversity within your unit. And we don't see any relationship between those. Um, so yeah, there's, I just present the six of those there. Um, these, these are the 43 units that responded. This, our survey isn't short, and so I am grateful for everyone who took the time to respond to it. Um, if, you're, if you're looking for your department and it wasn't on there, when we send it out again, you can make sure that your, your um, department head represents your unit. Um, briefly, I'll share a few results from our individual survey. I'll say we, we are, these are very preliminary. We are still in the process of really going through all these data, but we did want to show some of what we have. Um, and we're going to focus just showing on how, what people reported about the overall AAEA climate and their perceptions of that. And so we asked um, people to to do on one of those nice slidey scales, how they felt about a how they perceived the AAEA and their experience in the AAEA to be. Um, and we asked about things like the overall climate, is it a collaborative environment, collegial, cooperative, diverse, friendly, inclusive, respectful, supportive, welcoming. And um, I look at this and I think, I think it's like pretty, pretty good news for the most part. You can see that, um, not many people perceive, or about half of people perceive it to be diverse, though that is lower. Um, people perceive the AAEA to be friendly and respectful and welcoming. Um, we asked a lot of these questions, so I have a whole other slide of them. So whether or not you perceive that you belong, um, whether you perceive the AAEA has a commitment to diversity and inclusion, community, of whether we ask about whether the policy the AAEA harassment policy will be effective. Um, if you feel isolated, if you have an opportunity to leave, if you have opportunities for success, um, if you have opportunities to make a positive impact, the resources provided, whether you feel respected, and whether you perceive there to be too much focus on diversity and inclusion within the AAEA. And so what you can see is um, people don't feel isolated people don't feel like there's too much emphasis on diversity and inclusion, and people that, um, how do you assess what's okay and, and not for these type of questions? Um, I just saw that anonymous comment there. That's a great question. And so we're still sort of sorting out how to process these data and how to understand what because they are subjective too, right? Me saying 75% is different than Kelly saying 75%. Um, something that struck, just struck me is I, because we are sampling everyone and you have to take the time to go through our half hour survey and these questions are towards the end. Um, I was expecting, just to be totally honest, I was expecting a lot more negative results here. I thought that the people who made it this far would be more angry than people who didn't make it this far. So I was surprised to see an overall environment of satisfaction. Um, one thing I, I would really love to hear is if people have other ideas about representing these data or looking more closely at them, we could really use help and creativity. Um, one thing we did do is break this out by reported um, race, ethnicity, gender, those sorts of things. And we, we don't see a lot of heterogeneity across groups. Um, so I don't present those, but that was interesting um, to, my, to my mind. All right, I have now been talking for 11 minutes, so I'm gonna stop now. But look for more from us in the next few months. Um, if you have thoughts or perspectives, we really love all the feedback that we can get on this. Um, thanks for coming and being here today and thank you for the to the trust for finan the financial support for this work um, and encourage your unit how to keep an eye out and respond to our survey in 2021 again so i see one more question that is do you have a breakout of responses by underrepresented um minority um sorry what's white women white men what or um or uh, Titus, sorry, are you referring specifically to these graphs? 
when you ask that question? I will, ty I will type you an answer so that everyone can see. <laughs> I'll stop talking. I just yeah. unmuted in Titus, so he might be able to okay. type in. Yeah, I was just saying, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I'm specifically referring to uh, the chart that you showed towards the end. Yeah, so these ones here. Yeah, so I actually have a few of these buried. So this is breaking out um, female, male, student or career status, white, African-American, Asian, Hispanic, Latino, other, but in to a series of questions. So this first one is, do I feel like I belong in the AAEA? I feel respected at meetings, uh, diverse. So we do have those and, and you can see, and this is sort of why I didn't put these in right away was, they're still really similar. So, but thank you. That's a good question. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. I will stop sharing my screen and turn this over to, to the panel and to other, whatever we're doing next. All right. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, so to introduce our panelists today, we are very uh, fortunate to have hopefully my uh, internet connection is not cutting out on me. Um, Kelly, feel free to jump in if I <laughs> am not working. Um, we have Mary Bowman from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. We have DQ Fields from the University of Arkansas. We have Lorian Univer from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and Susan Offit from the National Academy of Sciences. Can folks hear me? Joyce is frozen, <laughs> so I'm going to jump in. Um, I do not have our list of, oh, she's back. Am I? Are you back, Joyce? Can you hear me? No. I was going to say, I don't have our panelist biographies on me um, to not miss any important details. Um, so we could let them introduce themselves to make sure we hit their own highlights. So we've got Mary Bowman. We were just getting to DQ when Joyce broke out. So maybe if you want to introduce yourself, DQ, where are you coming from? Yes, yeah, so I'm DQ Fields, Dean of the Dale Bumpers College of Ag, Food and Life Sciences at the University of Arkansas. Thank you. And then we'll move to Lorianne. Hi, I'm Lorian Uniper. I'm Professor Emerita, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, also spent significant parts of my career in the CGIAR system and at USDA ERS. Thank you. And then last but not least, Susan Offit. Hi, I am uh, most recently worked for FAO, but before that I was the Chief Economist at the Government Accountability Office, and before that 10 years as uh, the Administrator of the Economic Research Service, as was Mary, and before that I had a lot of jobs, including on the faculty at the University of Illinois. Thank you. I'm muted. We're going to start with some questions. women in particular who are getting majors in ag departments, in our departments, and then they're going and getting master's degrees, but they're not getting PhDs for some reason. And um, 
they're definitely not going into academic units. They're not being placed into those. More of them are entering postdocs, which is interesting, um, but they're not going into that faculty pipeline right away. So obviously there's some uh, dynamics that could influence someone to pick one position over another or to not want to get a PhD. Um, but that's something that we are noticing within the pipeline um, that stood out to me. When you look at underrepresented minority students, those numbers are small, pretty much across the board. So that is something that we need to, as a profession, really face and one and find some solutions and strategies for getting these people into our, our profession and into our pipeline. Well, I'll jump in. I was trying to be the gentleman and yield to ladies first, but uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, you know, I think that as we, you know, look at this kind of being a core value, we really have to evaluate how serious we are about diversity and inclusion as a core value for our, for our units. Um, if it is truly a core value, then we have to be very intentional in our efforts and really invest in a strategy around, you know, creating this pipeline and also recruiting faculty and students. I think that it is kind of a catch-22 because students come they're valued, where they're welcome, and then typically that typically that's a place where they see people who look like them and who they know will support them. Um, and so, you know, even, even you know, I think that you know we we have some strategies that that units are attempting, but you know, from the survey results, even you see that there is no true correlation between those strategies and actually increasing diversity. And I think it's because a lot of times we're just checking the box necessary by HR. Uh, to make sure that we, you know, had, had a diverse recruiting effort and this type of thing, but um, not sure that we're really as serious as we should be and really intentional about how we go about creating this, this actual pipeline. And, and I say that in, from, from actual experience. So one, one place that I will uh, kind of give, give um, a shameless plug to is the manifestation. Uh, I think that is an excellent pipeline program. Um, and I think Academia has really been, in my opinion, somewhat apathetic in its approach to recruiting at, at standards. Um, industry is, is really aggressive and very serious about uh, trying to find individuals to fill these jobs. So um, academia has gotten a reputation as one of the least desirable places, or least attainable, I'll say, places for minority uh, graduate students especially. Um, I think that, it, it, that, and that's become the case because it's hard to get in the door. And uh, I think that uh, a lot of it has to do with, with things that we have to really address, like uh, our unconscious and implicit biases. Um, I've been on search committees where there were candidates who were definitely outstanding and we get so into quantitative metrics that we are afraid to include a qualitative variable. And that qualitative variable will be in diversity. And so when that's the case, how do we really get beyond this point if, you know, we put that one minority um, who's part of our organization on the search committee, but there are four others who outvote them every time uh, and don't really listen to what they have to say regarding, you know, the, the applicants in the pool and don't look beyond, you know, how many publications or, or whatever. And, and it's not about just publications. I've seen where the, the quantitative metrics were even in there and individuals not given a chance at a place and they go somewhere else become a superstar. So we have to really think about how serious we are about it um, and how we can develop something that is attractive. You have to have a fertile environment for someone to come to uh, to be successful as well and they will know that. Um, I was department head at Auburn for about five or six years and you know at one point I had nine uh, African-American students in a master's and PhD program between Ag Econ and Rural Sociology. Most of them came from Manners, I will say. But, you know, they felt, and, and I was, it got to the point where I couldn't fund as many as I had opportunities to, to, to select. And I was sending them other places because, you know, they found out that, you know, we we're going to try to figure out a way to make sure that they were successful. They could compete anywhere in the world with, with any other graduate student. But they needed a place where they knew that they would be supported and the environment was fertile. So I'll stop there because I can talk about this all day. So. That's excellent. Do we have any direct feedback from, for what DQ was talking about? We also have a couple questions in the chat. Um, maybe up to the panelists. Yeah, Mary. 
I'll jump in, Kelly. I think TQ makes a really good point about being proactive and not just waiting for people to show up at your door. And um, when I was at USDA at ERS, we were very active in manners, went to all the meetings, talked to students. Um, it was a great connection. And I think those kinds of activities are valuable. I think we also have to look at what we're teaching and um, mentioning the economics profession. I think we can both learn from them on the good and the bad side. You know, they don't have a great track record, but they've been doing work to collect data, to share strategies. I was in San Diego at the last meetings and there was a big focus on diversity and inclusion for obvious reasons, none of them good about the profession. And um, they've got a whole um, set of resources on their website. Um, Lisa Cook uh, from Michigan State, I was very impressed by this work that she's doing to develop graduate students and her thinking. But I think there's also a fundamental thinking about what we're teaching. And um, the Raj Chetty at Harvard has a course on big data where he teaches economics from an example and analysis perspective, not from theory. And if you go to his Opportunity Insights website, he talks about the class and how the demographics were very different from more traditional introductory courses, I think because it was more interesting and appealed to people as a way to think about things that were interesting to them, but using economics um, and real life examples and data to bring it to life from an early stage and, you know, not wait till you may have lost people and they don't get to that in their third or fourth year. So I think there's a, there's a, like, this is something that really needs it, all of the above and what works. So I'll end there. Great points there. Other things from our panelists on this? Yeah, let's jump in. Um, there are a couple questions I personally know the answers to, so maybe our, hopefully our panelists do. Um, the first one from Take I could take a guess. I would say in terms of, of women, we're sort of at, we're close to parity, um, maybe a little lower, but um, I don't, I don't even want to hazard a guess actually speaking any further than that because I could very well be wrong. So the second part, advantages, benefits that appeal for ag econ versus econ. I think this gets a bit about what um, Mary was just talking about in terms of topics that appeal. I feel like we have a potentially more scope for very applied work that might appeal to a broader range of students. Um, I don't know if our panelists have anything, any thoughts on that to add. Um, this is Susan. I, I just, the historical perspective, um, in the late 70s and early 80s, there was the first really large infusion of non-traditional students, women and men with no farm background, into the ag econ field primarily because of interest in the world food situation. We'd had a world food crisis in the 70s, and also because of um, interest in the environment. And you know, your point about the scope of the field is a good one because it allowed at that time people to come and do applied work, um, which they really liked. So to me, there's always the question of whether, in addition to outreach and recruitment, you're actually, we as a discipline are working on problems that really call people to come to us. As Mary mentioned at ERS, you know, we are oriented, we're oriented to finding people who wanted to do policy work. Um, so I think the overall question is, well, would we get a more diverse group of people interested in this if we had a different set of research agendas or, or topics that we were known to be interested in? Points. All right. So good. We'll move to our next question from Zoe Placius. For the folks who have spent time, spent a lot of time in government, how do you think about the pipeline differently than you think about academic departments might think about pipelines? Does it differ? We have an unfortunate culture that academic jobs are the best jobs for PhDs, but there are fabulous jobs available in government. 
Can we better attract people to our PhD programs by making the opportunities in government more clear to potential students? Well, I can start here. I now um, was at the Economic Research Service for about 20 years of my career. And then I've been at the Bureau of Economic Analysis for the last couple years. And I'm um, now the acting director. And I, I think it's good news and bad news in terms of just the diversity of the staff. You know, I, my sense is it's more diverse than the data that you show. Um, one is we have a wider range of jobs. You know, it's people we, both organizations, we hire people at the master's degree, um, also located in a bigger city. Um, I don't know if that affects where people um, work. Lots of opportunities for dual career families in a large city like Washington, D.C. And then I think there's some structural things that make these welcoming jobs, which is not having tenure. Um, you know, we are high achievers, we expect a lot of people, but there's more flexibility in structuring the career to meet people's needs and more opportunity to move across organizations and not have to relocate by being in Washington, D.C. So I think there's ways that people can um, fit the job and their career to their personal life and um, more broader life priorities. And then Susan mentioned this, I mean, the work is great. Um, people want to work on issues. We work on real world problems that change and there's a way, there's a more direct connection to making a difference by influencing policy makers and government agencies tend to be bigger. You know, I started as an academic and the thing I loved the most about going to ERS was just having so many more people around. You know, it's easier to find a community, um, work in the team environment. And, you know, that's not for everybody, but that was something that I found valuable. And I think if we look at the profession and all the opportunities, I think it's definitely a plus to recruit students and let them know about the whole range of ways they could um, further their career after they get their degree. Excellent feedback. Um, our next one is one I was just thinking about yesterday. This is from Scott Swinton. Um, what are the underrepresented minority proportions and reference, reference populations that AAEA could consider, like US Census, since, <laughs> US census or the economics profession? We are far from the US Census <laughs> proportions. I'll say that as a starting point. Any of our panelists want to jump in? What should our reference point be? Yeah, I've been thinking about this too. I don't know what the right, right reference point to set is in terms of this. Econ seems like an obvious place to start. How are we comparing to econ um, more broadly? But especially because our, a lot of our departments don't get picked up in the econ surveys. Um, and so um, it'd be good to just, just compare those those numbers, but then or do you do we want to compare to like physics or to chemistry or something like that, or do we compare ourselves to to professions that have been historically populated by women like nutrition and nursing? I I, I don't know. <laughs> I like this question a lot, Scott, because um, it's an ongoing thought I have. Like, well, where are we headed? Like. What's the goal that we're working towards? What are we looking at and saying like this is this is what we want right now? I feel like we're sort of trying to get our feet under us and figure out where we are and then know where we what we should do next. So can I hi? This is Laurie, and can I just comment on that? Um, I actually I think that's a really interesting question uh, with respect to the land grant institutions that are the primary home institutions for, for the profession. And that I would have thought that um, in some sense, the census, because the land grant universities have that educational mission for the whole population. So you could either compare it with the undergraduate population as a whole or, or with the census population. Um, as I know, a lot of land grants advertise that they have the proportion of first generation uh, college um, entrance that they have. Uh, my alma mater, Davis, now I think was 
recently advertised they were majority in undergraduates they were majority um, first generation degree seekers so anyway so that that's just a suggestion to kind of think about that more broadly i think probably compared to econ or um or those other kind of more stem type um, disciplines we will come out looking good which is always nice to look good and advertise to the dean that you look better than average but <laughs> but maybe our, our long-term goal ought to be a little broader Oh, no. got another one from Titus that could take us the rest of our time. <laughs> There's a lot in here. Um, could panelists speak to ideas on best practices related to one, recruitment, including both upstream and downstream, two, effective mentoring pre, during, and post grad school, and three, inclusive climate to ensure better retention? Looks like DQ wants to chime in. He's laughing at this one. <laughs> Uh, that's the whole panel, Titus, but uh, <laughs> I'll jump in some, you know, um, I think when we talk about both upstream and downstream, um, I think it has to be part of the overall university culture um, for, for it to work well. And, and I think that it has to be invested in from the top. Um, colleges and, and definitely departments don't typically have resource flexibility to do the type of investments that that are necessary um and you know i think that there are ways to be creative through extramural funding also to look at ways to um you know try to increase our recruitment efforts we have to look at ways to you know get people interested in what we do earlier on and i think it's a you know i think it's a, a u.s problem almost in, in in on top of it we just have a problem getting domestic students into our graduate programs and through them but i think especially uh from a diversity standpoint um you know i i, I went to southern university as an undergraduate and, and one of the things that was uh, kind of led me into academia was a program called the bayou program where i had an opportunity to do summer research at cornell university um, and this was a program where, you know, you all expenses paid, plus you got paid to be there. And probably if it wasn't that, I wouldn't have gone uh, because I needed to make some money during the summer, some type of way. Uh, but, you know, just having the opportunity to um, ex see, get an experience for what it's like, feel what it's like uh, as a student, I think, is, is a, a way for some recruitment, you know, from the student population. Um, you know, when it comes to faculty, we, we have some serious university-wide challenges, I think, in, in how our search committees are structured um, and how we, how we actually, you know, put in some incentive there. Um, you know, I, there are some universities that have funding for strategic hires and things like that, and I think those are important because you have to get the, whether you find a candidate or not or you can recruit them forever, but the department usually makes that, that first recommendation to a dean um, on, on who they want to hire. And so if it doesn't come out of the department or a person doesn't get selected, um, you know, who's going to be that advocate that, that helps that, that individual, you know, even get recognized as a, as a serious candidate. Um, so um, in mentoring, Titus, I'll, I'll, I'll just speak briefly about that and I'll stop. But mentoring, I think, is, is probably one of the more critical things, uh, especially from a new faculty perspective. Um, Oftentimes, uh, a minority faculty member comes in and they get isolated and they, and they don't have research partners, things like that. And it's, we know what isolation does. You know, it's, if you want to be, you want to fall um, prey to, to a predator, you know, isolate yourself. And I think that, that that's what often happens where, you know, you expect it to sink or swim. Uh, some people didn't want you there in the first place. And then you're wondering, what do I do to be successful? And so I think mentoring and, and having someone to kind of give you, tell you the ropes, um, show you how to be successful is one of the key things I think every, every department should be looking at as a, as a, as a method of, of retention for faculty. Well, I can, I'd like to follow up on a couple of things that DQ said around the commitment from leadership and then also the importance of mentoring. And I think leadership is important and having um, women and underrepresented minorities move into leadership positions makes a difference. And there is work on how that happens. Um, 
And something in the survey I find troubling that other work has shown is problematic is the lower share of um, women and underrepresented minorities moving up from assistant to associate and the larger share taking postdocs compared to moving directly into faculty position. Um, research by McKinsey and others shows that the first promotion is key. And that's where a lot of um, women are lost, lost, so to speak, or don't get into the leadership track. It's not that they get almost to the glass ceiling, but in percentages wise, the first promotion is really a big stumbling block. And the things that are known to matter is um, a commitment to diversity, so that um, commitment from the top, um, peer mentorship, you know, really having someone take you under their wing, work you through the issues, talk about, you know, strategies or soft skills, for lack of a better word, um, and give managers some flexibility to drive change, you know, let people work with people at a unique level, and then some basic things around ensuring that promotions and reviews are fair, focusing on accountability, tracking what happens, and um, making people accountable for the standards and expectations that you set out. So I think more work on the leadership development will pay dividends and there's some signs out there that, that this is a need for our profession. I just wanted to add based on your um, comment about the first promotion, our survey data asks for times for various milestones. So we're hoping to have some answers about how long it's taking different groups to get to that first promotion. Um, we will have some issues and that we'll miss people who have fallen out of our profession before hitting that and haven't taken our survey. Um, we can at least say it's taking, you know, this group this many years, this group this many years on average. Um, yeah, we hope to tease that out more. Any other feedback on this big question we've got here? Good. Um, all right. So Norbert has some great comments in the Q&A. Uh, not so much questions, but commentary. So I thought we could maybe unmute him if he is still here and willing to discuss for us. All right, Norbert, you are unmuted. Okay. Hi, everyone. I wasn't expected to uh, <laughs> join in. I, I, I did want to just raise a point, um, being very careful about how we present the idea of underrepresented minorities and the, hit, the hitting the return button gets you in trouble in Zoom. But clearly I was trying to edit that a little bit further, but the point is um, lumping up a, a lot of people who just don't happen to be white as underrepresented minorities can actually distort what is being represented, especially if we're gonna make comparison across different organizations or groups. So for example, NSF, and I didn't go and look at NIH, but my understanding of NIH is probably similar to NSF. So I, and, and it's not to say that we don't have issues with other people groups who don't fall into that definition of underrepresented minority in our particular association. But I think if we're gonna use the language of underrepresented minority, we should at least benchmark it against other organizations that use that same terminology, uh, especially if they're federal agencies. So I just wanna be careful about how we represent who is uh, in our association, um, what that means. The other side of it is, and this gets really complicated in talking about whether or not someone's domestic born or US born and all that, and I'm not trying to get into those issues. We need people from all sorts of experiences to be in our departments, to teach our students, to do the research because they're bringing what they are and who they are to those questions and asking interesting questions because of their backgrounds and because of the training that they receive. So for all those reasons, I think we want to be mindful of that, but let's make sure we're using terms in a way that um, if someone from outside of the conversation hears it, they know exactly what we're talking about. So thank you for, for that opportunity. That's a great point. Also, our individual survey will let us get um, a little bit of a finer scale on folks. Um, so mm -hmm. the department level survey was kind of very broad groupings to make it easy um, versus for the individual survey, we've asked, were you born in the US or not? Um, more detailed race and ethnicity questions, questions about um, any sort of disabilities and things like that. Um, so I completely agree that we need to be a little more detailed in how we consider the data. 
Yeah, yeah, and, and just, and this was sort of when we were designing the department head survey, it was an ongoing discussion that we were having of we're asking someone else to, to put people into groups and, and there's some uh, discomfort in doing that. And it's, it's hard. It's like a hard survey to do too. It took people a lot of time. And so we were trying to think of how do we make this easy? Um, but in going forward and thinking about our next rounds, um, we need to be cognizant of the definition, especially because you're like, you're completely right. There is a, it's a real definition. There's a, there are benchmarks that we should, can and should be using. So. The question buried in the chat that follows along these lines um, from Sally Thompson, we are increasingly seeing foreign born faculty in ag econ, econ departments. So what is the implication of that for DEI? Um, I will say that we've lumped foreign born and domestic in those pie charts that you saw today. I don't think we know in the pie charts if someone is foreign born or domestic. Um, yeah, not but the it, department yeah. level. Right. But the individual level survey, we can tease that out more. Yeah, exactly. This, this is Susan. I, I haven't been in the academic um, environment in a while, but this question of U.S. citizenship, wherever you know, you're born, is important for government recruitment because you need to be a U.S. citizen to work in federal government, and that can be a barrier. There are workarounds that are not very, you know, perhaps being hired as a consultant, but that's not the same thing as having a permanent job. So the composition of the graduate um, population is important, and this was actually an issue um, in the move of ERS to Kansas City, where the raw numbers made it look like there were a lot of people who could work for a government agency, but in fact, there were not so many because of this U.S. citizenship requirement. But I think Sally's question, and someone else needs to come out, you know, goes to me goes to this question of, you know, what is the culture? I mean, this discipline had a very strong culture that was related to its roots in farming and agriculture, people with farm background. Um, that began to change, certainly, um, but maybe it goes back to the original question of, you know, who counts as underrepresented and what is the right number? I mean, do, you know, do we think that people who come from other countries somehow aren't diverse? And are we talking about diversifying domestic students, particularly say um, Blacks or Hispanics. I mean, what, as, as it, it brings up this question, what is the goal again? And it's sensitive to discuss, but that's sort of at the root of all these uh, ways of looking at diversity. more commentary on that. Um, we got a more specific question then from Christine Moser. Has anyone discussed doing something like the AEA summer program? Bring a group of undergrad students together and combine training with mentoring. It could also be done with incoming grad students. Uh, she says she was the associate director of the program at MSU. Um, no of any thoughts on this program? I'm sure that we have enough probably AAEA institutional knowledge. We have some folks who've been here for a bit, but I'm not sure if they are on this side of things. No. Is there anyone no. in our audience who would want to spearhead that task? <laughs> Raise your hand. <laughs> You've got a job. Volunteer. Can folks hear me? Yes, Jace. Yay. Um, so I know one issue we've run into is that the um, mentoring committee um, does not uh, sort of officially in any capacity work with Seaway and Cosbay. So all of the mentoring activities um, that, that they run through AAEA have really been separate from anything that our sections have done. Uh, so that's definitely an area where I think we could work together better um, and, uh, you know, there have been great mentoring programs, um, but I think they certainly could address diversity, equity, and inclusion better. There's a comment from Norbert in the Q&A that the AAEA board and others are discussing this. So 
I'll also mention, like, I don't, I didn't go to a big ag school as an undergrad. My undergrad work was not, had nothing to do with ag. And I know I would have loved this program to figure out what ag was. I sort of accidentally found it. And so this could also be a way to reach people who aren't already in our world, but really want to get that applied background. Because this is something that's been said by a bunch of panelists. What, the work we do is so cool. It's so great. Everyone should want to do it. And by facilitating that opportunity for people outside and bringing them into our ag schools, I think that that's, I, I'm, I would have loved it when I was an undergrad. More stuff in the chat. You guys are challenging me by putting them in different spots. Um, question from Scott. Pushing beyond Christine's point, in the name of rigorous training, do our PhD programs create hurdles and stress levels that end up excluding students who could subsequently perform as excellent applied economists? So one thing I was wondering is that we don't really have number or that like we didn't ask this question in such a way to get numbers on was um, how many people are commencing a PhD program and then not finishing it? And are those people women or people within different underrepresented minority groups? And so I don't have a good sense of that at this point. And I wonder if within departments themselves, there's a better sense. My The unit I'm in now, we don't have a PhD program, so this isn't something um, we're considering. But I wonder uh, if others do have some thoughts on that. Could you ask that question again, Kelly, uh, just for clarity? Sorry, I was going through my chat and I have a giant thunderstorm. If anyone saw me jump, <laughs> you could see my video. Um, sorry, I was scrolling back in the chat for that. Where are we? Uh, okay. Pushing beyond Christine's point, in the name of rigorous training, do our PhD programs create hurdles and stress levels that end up excluding students who could subsequently perform as excellent applied economists? Um, this is Susan. I, you know, I don't know, you know, Scott's talking about rigor and maybe that's code for quantitative analysis and mathematics. And I was struck in yesterday's session about people brought up this notion that there's a trade-off or might be a trade-off between diversity and rigor and you know we need to talk about whether the students that we would like to recruit um, are as well prepared as they need to be to come into the field the way we currently have it structured or alternatively if you want to change the structure of the field but but I, you know i that struck me yesterday was this idea that, well, you know, we can't get more diverse because we're, there's too much math. I mean, that's basically what it comes down to. And uh, I think until we're willing to address that, um, this is going to be just a bunch of platitudes about, you know, helping people um, do better. So, so I, I kind of thought that was what the question was asking. And I personally don't believe that rigor is the issue. Um, I think that the issue is more of mentor than isolation. Um, you know, just from from interacting with students, if if they, I, I don't think any of us who have been successful could do it as an island. And I think that sometimes when you are the only one or one of a few, you are an island, and uh, there's there are not systems in place to make sure that you have the resources at hand that you need to be successful. And, uh, you know, it's, again, that sink or swim mentality. Um, I think that to get through the screening process, most students are capable of completing a program. Now, our students, do they require some additional, um, I think it's more an idea of not being exposed to some of the same things that other students have been exposed to versus an idea of them not being able to handle the rigor. I think that they can, they can rise to the challenge. Um, but I think you have to, to understand some of the other things with the environment or the culture that impact how well they are able to compete. Um, so there, there, there's, you know, when, when you come into a situation, when you come into a hostile environment, you have other things that you're dealing with. And I, I know that we don't want to say our environments are hostile, but you have to look at it from their perspective and know that so when, when you're in a classroom and you are basically uh, felt you also you come in feeling as if you're invisible um, you're dealing with a challenge that no one else is dealing with and when uh, other students have information that they're not sharing 
you have a different challenge on your hands. So I think we have to think more about the environment and the culture in our departments versus whether students can handle the rigor. I think that, you know, students, uh, once they get through that process, we can look at transcripts and see what, what preparation students have. Uh, and I, I've seen students who could, who could leave one place and be unsuccessful there and go somewhere else and, and thrive in, in what's supposed to be a higher ranked institution. And I think it's the culture, not necessarily rigor. Great comments. We have um, Jill McCluskey, who just arrived. Uh, we, so we introduced our panelists at the beginning. Um, so Jill, if you want to take just a moment to introduce yourself, I'm guessing you don't need much of an introduction, but just in case. So sorry for being late. I'm a, a, the director and a regents professor in the School of Economic Sciences at Washington State University. And I came from an emergency budget meeting with our budget cuts that are happening. So. Uh, so uh, I'm just happy to be here. I've had a long interest in, in issues in diversity and uh, hope I can add to the conversation. Awesome, thank you, glad you could make it. Um, let's see, there's a new comment that just popped up in the chat and I might just give her the floor because a good one. Um, Shafali, if you are here, you are unmuted for the question you just put in here. Oh my, okay. <laughs> it's funny, I, I, yeah, I really appreciate that you're doing this, first of all, and I, uh, I've been coming to AA since about 17 years, and I have watched many of you over that time. And I think one of the challenges, and I raised this actually, I think it was after you spoke, Mary, at the lunch for AA in Washington, DC. And it was that the track record in academia is worse than private sector, which is always interesting because you would not think from the mindset that would be the case. And if you look at, you peel back the layers, part of it is just how we, almost every part of the pipeline, right? From how we evaluate, how we set expectations up and, and through. So if I look back, and this is just very individual, but compare my 12 years in corporate, my 17 years kind of AAA, like Agicon has been a fundamentally difference, respo different response. And I think one is even the fact that someone would say that they think diversity and rigor are a trade-off to me says there's something fundamentally wrong with the mindset and culture of this industry and this discipline. And I know that there are a lot of very talented people who basically just self-select right out because why would you want to be in an environment that is explicitly signaling its toxicity when you know that there are many other options out there. And I think that that's, a, that's the root cause. And, and the other piece is you can't change it. I love that it's the women, the people of color, the people who have to drive the change and embed it are the people who have been, I think, least active in this conversation. And there are many, by the way, proof points in STEM fields, and I threw one in there. I'm on the advisory council for the School of Stats at the University of Minnesota. Over 50% of their graduate students are women. I think they're actually approaching maybe 60. It's actually amazing. They're actually more rigorous mathematically than AggieCon is going to be. And they're people of color numbers. We're seeing this across the board in stats. We're seeing it happening in engineering. So I think it's an absolute cop-out. I think the issue is that as a community, we signal that people are not wanted. And that's a bigger issue. So sorry, there should be, a, I mean, that was a statement to all of you that I didn't expect to share. I think the question there would then be, how do we actually get the right individuals in the, in the discussion and make tangible change, including things like fundamentally changing the metrics that you have around tenure? I still look at some of those metrics are so outdated. It's surprising that they're still used and don't take into account the fact that a good professor should have a lot more besides a number of publications and other things. And so can you even, since you are all in some very decision-making influential roles, can you change some of these metrics or are you, are you still, are your hands still tied? Well, since I'm new to the conversation right now, I, I'll just, I'll say one thing that I would like for a bigger emphasis on having journal editors to, to include more diversity. Uh, so to include more women and more people of color. And um, so I recently got all the, all the data from AJE from all the, from all the, um, 
articles and these and there's a problem that they're only the accepted ones but i'm really interested in for over the last 20 years all the articles for aje all the uh gender and um and ethnicities of the of the authors and the and uh i'll look at citations and then also um also the topics that are covered so i'm really interested in in things like that and i'm and i will also try to add who the who the editor was so to really look at things like that you know that we want to uh we want to make sure that there that there is that there is more diversity in the in the journal editorships there have been some papers that have found that uh that women have to um have to learn to write better in order to be published so it's harder for women to get published actually they learn to write better and it's and i think that there I think that there is a problem of um, I call it an expectation bias that um, that people expect um, probably women and, and underrepresented minority scholars to be not as good and so there's actually I think there's a higher bar for them in in publishing and so this is just something something to think about that we need that we need more diversity in the editorships especially of our of our top journals Well, I'll follow up on Jafali's comment about um, making a focus on recruiting the breast and the brightest. And I think that is a really important point at starts at all levels, is how do you make someone who's really talented want to come and stay in your field? I mean, I think about my first AAEA meeting or, you know, it, I'm not sure, I don't hardly remember where it was, but it was certainly, it was back in the 80s. It was a fairly male profession, but I was at Davis in a time when we had majority female graduate students in my cohort. Yes, and the data show that was a blip for two years that has yet to be repeated, but I think that had a big, you know, very important in terms of why I felt belonging and um, besides the interest in what the profession does and the problems you can solve. But I do think you should put ourselves in the shoes of people and what can we make it attractive for someone in an undergraduate class or who comes to our, their first professional meeting, um, joins a graduate program. And a lot of the things have been brought up of mentoring, being welcoming, um, and, and then changing too, that we have to change at all levels so that we look you know, more like the kind of people we want to attract in the long run to be a vibrant profession. So, um, hi, I, I was just going to comment, um, and this is a little bit tangential, but I think it goes to what um, Shafali was saying, which has to do with who we are substantively. And um, I think Susan alluded to this, this history of the evolution of the profession. And over the course of my professional lifetime, the breadth of the questions that are asked has um, has really expanded. It's a wonderful thing. There's been both push and pull factors in that there's, you know, funding for new and different kinds of problems as well as, you know, the AEA um, move towards having sections and being more welcoming uh, and, and embracing applied as opposed to agricultural. But I think there's still more work to do there and that's part of how people would, uh, different kinds of people would see themselves um, uh, pursuing our profession. And I think still, we still have a, uh, a naming problem. Um, and I think honestly, we still, we may have, um, uh, this question arises about diversity kind of generationally. And I'm, and I'm glad that this group has, I'm really glad this group has taken um, a hold of the question of running the survey and is actually talking about institutionalizing it um, as a regular thing because that has not been the case. But I think, um, we may also look to the fact that um, we might have as a profession, I think, in the last decade or so kind of plateaued in terms of the scope and breadth and relevance of what we're doing. And, um, and I think that um, 
may also be part of this puzzle about greater diversity. And it was alluded to yesterday in the great session yesterday about um, how we're going to be intellectually stagnant if we don't um, also embrace diversity. So anyway, I just, I, I wanted to throw that in there and kind of um, remind us that it's, it's part of the package of what we're about in terms of, of all those things that attracted us to, um, to our profession in terms of relevance um, and in terms of working on important uh, issues for society, uh, whether they're food and ag related or not. Sure, if you saw the question in the chat, but it relates a lot to what Zoe just put in there, um, directed at you, Lorianne, um, or other panelists, Zoe says, it's interesting to me to think about changes that have occurred over time in academia. What are the key things that have changed in this DEI space and academic departments? What has not? What are the same conversations that have been happening forever? Are there things we can do differently now to move the needle forward? You okay. know, I'll, 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 <laughs> go ahead, Susan. No, you were supposed to take my place. I wasn't supposed to be talking. <laughs> um, well, okay, so I, um, I had actually kind of prepared my remarks in, uh, uh, more in that historical context in terms of what's changed and what hasn't. And um, so I think um, what the survey shows us is that white women have made a lot of progress in terms of representation um, in the profession. Other groups, not so much. However, you parse out um, who's among the underrepresented minorities, there's still such a small slice that um, obviously, uh, no matter who they are, they're underrepresented um, or what, what types of diversity um, is in that, um, that group. Um, I think there's also been progress in terms of transparency. I would noted that in the policies that were reported as having been adopted by institutions, the ones that were in that 70% or inst of respondents said, my institution has this kind of policy. It mainly related to transparency, that we have a much clearer idea now of um, of what the expectations are. Uh, those are more clearly uh, articulated for both job performance and promotion. I, I, I think that's true. That's my sort of qualitative assessment. And the fact that um, people are at least paying lip service to them, um, I think bears that out. Certainly when I was uh, joined the Illinois faculty in 85, those things were extremely murky, not well articulated at all. And I think they're, they had became much better articulated over the course of my lifetime. The place where I thought um, we're still talking about the same stuff was also the place where, frankly, institutions have to put some skin in the game and commit some resources. And those relate to those things like spousal placement, regular review of equity and salaries, uh, and promotion. I think that happened formally once while I was a faculty member at Illinois. Uh, and, uh, and there was a third one in there, but they were the ones that were down in slide seven of Anna's presentation, the ones that were down in the sort of 40% or less of institutions indicated them. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's the part where um, progress is tough because it means institutions have to, have to do something real. Um, and uh, the one, I will also just comment, the one that was uh, missing in there that was a big part of um, our conversations in the early 90s and Seaway organized a, a, a session around it, um, has to do with family accommodation. And um, I have to say it's a subject near and dear to my heart since um, my husband and I were silly enough to have two kids 18 months apart while we were both assistant professors. Uh, so the whole issue about family accommodation, and I think we now have 30 years of experience at many institutions in terms of uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly with tenure extension, um, uh, with other kinds of, of things. I think those are, are, are worthy of revisiting in discussion. Um, and I, as a final comment on that, I was doing a tiny bit of literature search on what other professions have done and found a very recent article out of the STEM field that said that um, over 40% of women and over 20% of men had left full-time STEM employment after the birth of their first child. So um, I know we're not as um, uh, time intensive as those lab, many of those lab-based uh, disciplines, but I thought that was a very telling 
uh, statistic and, and also something I, oddly I didn't hear discussed during the hour and a half yesterday of, of many other good comments. Uh, one of the questions that occurs to me is, where do students who we would like to bring into our pipeline, where do they, where, where do they go? If they don't come to us, where do they go? Um, do they go to statistics? Do they go to general econ? Do they go to sociology? You know, what is happening to people? Now, there, there are more options than there were 30 years ago in terms of quant getting quantitative training. Most policies, public policy schools now have beefed up econometrics and statistics. But, but the real question goes to our relative attractiveness as a discipline. And I think this is Lorian's point. Have we sort of plateaued in terms of addressing problems that are interesting to people? This happens to disciplines. Um, my father was a physical chemist and then physics came along and there were many fewer physical chemists after that because the big questions could be answered by physics. So, you know, I got to tell you, when Jill, when you do your journal deep dive, let's look at crop insurance. Crop insurance is important, but how many more papers do we have to have about it? And you know why we do them? This is me talking, I'm retired. Because the data are easy to get. And if we're gonna be a profession, <laughs> that just works on data that are easy to get, we're going down. So I think we need to do a little inward reflection on uh, where we're really trying to go as a discipline, which of course is absolutely and antithetical to everything that we do as independent scholars. But still, I, I really got to wonder. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just I'll just follow up on that, Susan. I, actually, Susan and I talked about a year ago about how women saved AggieCon, and it was basically that we were getting a, a bringing in a more diversity of topics and thought that we were bringing that. And if we just stayed only with crop insurance, I do think that most of our programs would be gone. You know, if we if we were so narrow. So I. I am really excited about the future, Lorian. I do not think we are st we are stagnant as a field because I think we're going into areas, into broader areas, including the things that you know, like Norbert studies in um, food security and issues like that. So I I think I and I think that there's it's such an exciting future, and we're not we're not limited at all. Yeah, I, I want to bring this question back to the jobs point that someone asked earlier about um, when students are in the graduate programs, what's the future? Is it academia? Can you bring in federal jobs? I think there's a lot of good opportunities in the private sector with the um, big um, information companies like Google and Amazon. They hire applied economists. What are some other places? And, um, you know, way back in the, when I started, it was some of these big agribusiness companies and they have much smaller research groups now, but I suspect there's a big private sector part that we could embrace more in our profession through the AAEA, as well as, you know, recruit students, really top-notch students into programs with that as one of the menu of things they could do if they invest in this degree and, and they bring a lot to our profession. So one, one thing I hear right now from some students that I work with, so these are, these are master's students, is if they're evaluating whether to go and get an AggieCon PhD, they're also comparing against public policy programs rather than comparing against econ programs. And it's because they're thinking about jobs in government but don't perceive the AggieCon programs to be training them for that. Um, I keep telling them, well, that's not true because I'm I, out of my PhD cohort. I'm the only one who's in an academic placement right now, and that's mostly by choice. Um, so I, I wonder if there's something that these public policy programs are signaling, um, aside from literally being called public policy, that that we could pick up and and say, like, look at look at all the things you can do. We're not we're not narrow at all. That dovetails a bit with a question from Sally Thompson in the chat. 
Many don't go on for PhDs after getting their MS, as the survey showed. Is that a bad thing? Do we still count them as ag economists? So if they're going to those policy departments for their PhDs, what they have training in ag econ, are they still ours or have they left our profession or any thoughts there? Or if they're still working as an ag economist, but just in a different realm. Your thoughts? <laughs> we just don't have a great way to track them probably. Well, no, I, I was hoping Don would be here as a, you know, recruit them in, uh, they're, they're ours if they find a home in the AEA and do they find a home in the AEA? I don't know because so much of the meetings are oriented towards academic progression and academic recognition. So um, I think that's a question for the current board. <laughs> Don is here, we could unmute her if we want to. Oh, did she just, she might have. Yeah, I unmuted oh, no. her. Yeah, yeah, you unmuted her, you beat me to it. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm, I'm here, but yeah, that, that is our challenge. And Sally wrote me an email after my address with the same kind of thoughts of, of you know, number one, I still think our sessions, to Jill's point, are far more diverse than they were when I came in the profession and I was searching the program for something that was interesting to me and my ability to find um, particularly sessions at the meetings that are more interesting to me have become far easier. I hadn't thought about it before Susan said this, but th that kind of comes to the point of, do the, session, the diversity of sessions we see at our typical meetings now get mirrored in our journals? And I'm not sure the answer is yes. I think if you put the four journals we have together, maybe, and Tim Beatty is actively working on an open source journal, kind of equivalent to the European Q, that might even increase that further. But specifically, if you look at AJE, I would say we still do not see in AJE what we see in our, our meetings program now. And I, I think it's why our meetings attendance actually stabilized, even though it was dropping precipitously at the start of my, my career. So, but you know, um, Sally brought up that, you know, bring people beside, economic research service is awesome. Occasionally we get ag marketing service or RMA, but why aren't we bringing other parts of the government too that, uh, and I, you know, I, so one of my challenges is, I really think we need to rethink our government relations and perhaps even think about if it's a committee or it's a section and, Think broadly about the network of people we not only have in DC, but we have across the country in um, state and, and local and federal agencies, who again, we could be a home for, but we haven't been a, a particularly super great home, except for ERS, I think has always felt it was a home place for them. So I think there's a few challenges all embedded in there and that might even get to the public policy question. So um, it's one of 23 things I have on my to-do list. I probably won't do any of them well, but anybody who wants to have a conversation about that. I, I, I have a government relations committee for the first time next week and I'm going to challenge them to think big and uh, I put some new members on it with the hope that they would. So um, um, if you have any comments on that, get those to me. I'll be quiet now. Thank you, Don. Any feedback from our panel or any last minute questions from our attendees? I think I've caught all the questions in the chat and Q&A. Uh, one more point. I hope before we close that Anna will share where the report will be published and available to the members of AAEA. Great. Question. Yeah, so that was one thing I just did is um, <laughs> just for expediency, I, I popped both of both the report we shared um, and the slide they presented today just on my website so I can share that link. Um, the other thing is we are looking for more formal outlets where we can integrate both these surveys and present more broadly our findings. Um, I also saw a question in the very beginning that was about making data available. I, we need to do some um, IRB based retractions of some information, of course, but um, based on the IRB that we received, there's no reason that we can't put those on a, on a dataverse or something like that for people who are interested. So that's something I'll look to do um, if that's actually something people want. So, yes, I, I will share, I, I don't know the best way to share the link um, but I'll talk to Joyce and Kelly and find a way to do that. So um, well, I, I might have tuned out, but are, are you going to publish this in the um, AEPP? I, we'd like to. We don't have a formal manuscript yet. Um, we just have, since we got money from the trust, we wrote a report for the trust based on the department head survey. But we're also analyzing the individual survey to integrate them into one 
document um, or one piece that we would hopefully publish in AEPP. That is sort of our um, another um, a quick <laughs> send. Um, I, I feel like you should send a letter with um, um, the report highlights to all the deans of colleges of ag and indicate whether or not their department responded. <laughs> That's why. I love that. That's a great idea. Uh, and Zoe chimed in that we can put this, the report links on the CUA website on the AAEA page, which is a great idea. And Joyce just said the same thing. <laughs> We're on the same page. Excellent. Last few minutes. Any last questions before we lose our great panel of people? I was wondering actually if folks could say a little something about what they think needs to happen with mentoring, what we are not doing well. <laughs> and how we might change our culture around mentoring uh, in the in the profession. Um, so this is Mary and Joyce, I would be interested in what you see is not working. Is it that um, we're not reaching enough people? We're not um, making individual connections? Are we not mentoring at all career levels? Um, I think Mentoring is a big, fee, you know, a big area of need, and that you know we could identify more things to do. Um, and so it, maybe that's something we need to go to people and find out where their priorities are. AAEA has invested a lot on mentoring, but I think it's not that each of those efforts might not have met a need, but maybe we haven't yet hit what's most important or some key gaps. And we, I'd certainly be help willing to invest in doing new things and would value trying to find out where the needs are. I think in my view, I see it sort of two main issues. So one is that um, there's a lot of kind of uh, unspoken knowledge that um, people are, are expected to have and some folks have it and a lot of underrepresented groups don't uh, because of uh, the underrepresentation, right? Um, and so that's one issue and then we don't convey that information well to, to folks. Um, and then the other is that mentoring oftentimes is not rewarded or valued by departments or, or unit heads. And so all of that work, um, you know, to the extent that it takes time away from research uh, becomes problematic for building up your reputation based on the current sort of, um, you know, standards that we have in the, Forms, maybe I should say. I think that's a challenge for AAEA to find ways maybe to help in the discipline and the you know the information out there shows that this is a key aspect to helping people advance in their careers. So there is a known payoff. I would just like to add one way I, I write some tenure and um, promotion letters and one thing that I've been noticing uh, and with some some young women, you know, going up for promotion and tenure and, and just people in general is that some of them have co-authored with with mentors that are from a different university. And I was just thinking, wow, that's win win. You know, it, it helps the senior person, you know, with a, to work with a great assistant professor and and then it actually makes the mentor relationship more real, you know, because if you're, if you're doing research with the person, you're more likely to have a real deeper relationship where you can talk about, talk about all these issues, all of this information that Joyce was mentioning, if you're, if you're working together closely. So I, I really, I really feel like that's one way to, that people get it right when they, um, when there's a senior mentor who is actually doing research and publishing, and then that the publishing is also rewarded for the senior person. And I'll follow up briefly on, on Jill's comments. You know, I, I think that we really have to be intentional about extending that network of mentors. Uh, I think oftentimes you feel that the only mentor can be within the same unit. And we, we all know that mentoring is work and, and it does require an investment, basically. It's an investment in the future when you are serving as a mentor. And, you know, right now, there are not very high rewards for it. So it's, it's kind of your service work and, and, and the investment that you're willing to make. 
And, you know, I, like, like uh, Mary indicated, you know, we know that it works. Um, and if we see that it works and we're really uh, serious about growing this, then we have to be serious about making that investment. We have to be serious about making that, I'll say more than an investment, that sacrifice. Uh, a mentoring requires a sacrifice. Uh, yes, we could be doing something different. We could be um, working on our research and not thinking about anyone else, but it requires that sacrifice. And, you know, everyone is not a great mentor also. Uh, and so we have to know who those individuals are who can serve as good mentors. And a lot of times uh, the issue is that good mentors kind of get overworked because everybody wants to work with that person who they know is a good mentor. So we have to kind of groom the next, next group of mentors and provide some of those incentives. Great feedback on that topic. I think that probably we should wrap it up right at 2.29. Um, I'd like to say thank you to all of our panelists. You guys have been excellent. Thank you for taking time out of your busy lives and all of that in the middle of a pandemic to come and talk to all of us. It's been great. Um, this will be, it has been recorded and it will be made available um, also going on the CUA website. Um, if you did not catch the session yesterday, I highly encourage you to watch that recording as well because it was excellent and it pairs well with this one. Um, and with that, this ends all of the CUA events for the 2020 annual meeting. So it's been awesome. We appreciate your time and attendance.